Okay, Facebook is going live. All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining our Techie Tuesday. This week we're with Mac Chester. He's a Micron test engineer. And we're gonna learn about his journey from Legos to microchips. So Mac, take it away, please. Thank you, Cynthia, and thank you for having me today. Welcome um, online. And um, uh, my name is uh, Mac and um, I do work for Micron Technology, which is a, a memory technology company. Uh, it originated in Boise, Idaho, and has since expanded out to virtually all corners of the world, I think, at this point. So I myself am uh, based here in Boise, so I'm sitting in my home office as uh, Micron is quarantining us uh, at this point because of the pandemic that's going on, of course. So um, I'm just going to uh, kind of walk you through my journey to, um, in, to the engineering world and to Micron. And I'm going to use Legos as, as sort of the stepping block, uh, pun intended, for uh, my story as we kind of move along from there. So uh, just a note here, a couple of notes. Please keep yourself muted during the presentation, and you can keep your video off for now. Uh, there will be questions. I have three poll questions along the way, so you can participate with those. Um, if you would just put the um, answers to the questions that I pose to you into the chat, and make sure that you're sending that out to everyone, and Cynthia will be kind of screening those as well. So um, you can put it in there. If you're watching us live on Facebook, you can also type your question into the Facebook comments, and uh, those will be monitored as well. So. Um, I'll have some time at the end. I uh, left a pretty good amount of time at the end of the presentation for questions as well. So, okay. Well, I'm a Lego geek, so may the Lego force be with you today. Um, in the background of that picture, uh, this slide, you can see uh, one of my most recent um, accomplishments, which was a 1700 piece uh, Lego set of, of course, the iconic Millennium Falcon. So. Uh, my wife knows that my love of Lego and building things um, has lasted from my childhood all the way into my adulthood. Um, and so I've always had this um, kind of innate like curiosity of how things work. And so that's carried me forward in, in many ways and sort of led me into this path of engineering that I've uh, ended up in. So from a pretty early age, um, you can see here a precocious uh, little kid. I grew up in a little town in New Mexico, um, up in the near the Four Corners area where uh, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona all meet. I grew up sort of close to that area in a little town called Farmington. And um, it's hard to tell here, but the shirt that I'm wearing says, here comes trouble. You can't really see the trouble hiding behind ice, a box of ice cream there, but um, you can see this other picture here. Uh, as kids, we very often were playing with Legos or blocks, and you can see from the picture here, um, there's there's me hiding in the background watching my younger brother Ted uh, pull blocks uh, from this tower, which is apparently about to collapse and fall on top of him, and I think there's a hint of a smile on my face. So. Um, I guess it was a bit of trouble even in, in my um, early years as I was uh, building things and spending time um, figuring out how things worked. You know, I'd get a remote control car and I'd play with it and play with it. And then after a while, I'd get a curiosity to take it apart. <laughs> and so I would take things apart and put it back together. And sometimes I put it back together right, and other times I didn't. Um, so I was always sort of in this uh, mode of curiosity. And then that led me uh, into my college years. And so I just happened to find my old um, college uh, student ID. And so um, I'm a graduate of uh, Boise State University right here in Boise. Um, I graduated in 2001. And it had ended up that in the summer of 2000, my senior year um, that I was at Boise State, I uh, was an intern at Micron. And so I ended up. Um, interning in the summer of 2000 with Micron, and uh, that led into actually part-time work. So they actually let me um, stay on part-time because I was going to school locally. And um, 
I ended up finishing my senior year as kind of a part-time employee and then came on full-time after I graduated in um, 2001. And so a lot of the, you know, throughout my, my earlier years in junior high and high school, um, I, I was always excelling in mathematics and the sciences and um, just, you know, trying to, to keep myself sort of curious and, and learn new things. Um, we didn't quite have, we had some programming that was going on back in those days, but there, you know, computers were just kind of coming into schools. Um, in junior high, can I remember I learned how to type on a keyboard on an actual like typewriter, which I know is like a dinosaur, like an archaic museum piece at this point, but um, that's where I even learned those pieces. And, and then that carried forward as uh, I got into um, the end of high school, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And I had a, a guidance counselor in high school who encouraged me to look at um, possibly pursuing a math degree or a physics degree and even an engineering degree. So once I got to university, I started taking all these classes that more or less overlap because you have to take the math and the physics um, no matter where you're going to be heading into some of those fields. And I started taking some basic engineering classes and fell in love with it. And so that kind of helped me sort of guide me through uh, getting into engineering. So even to this day, um, I still have a curiosity as my slide showed of the Millennium Falcon that I built um, back in about Christmas time, I guess. Um, and so I have a recent picture of myself with baby Yoda. So I thought I'd share that as well um, since baby Yoda came to our house um, this past uh, weekend. So it was exciting for us to finally meet him in person. So. All right, so I want to pose a, a poll question out to the audience. And so maybe the first thing I'd ask you is, uh, what has been one of your favorite Lego kits to build or even anything else? Um, something that you've enjoyed um, building, whether that be a remote control car, I know like today, uh, the kits for drones and uh, airplanes and um, remote control cars is very popular. There's a lot of different technologies out there and a lot of fun things that you can do. So, um, so if you're listening out there and you have a particularly favorite um, Lego kid or something that you like, um, go into the chat and uh, drop that in there. So, all right. Just watching um, Spider-Man Homecoming. So I'm watching all the Marvel movies in in sequence and in, in correct sequence, I guess it is. And so I just got done with Spider-Man homecoming and his friend has the Death Star, the Lego Death Star. And he finds out that Peter Parker is, um, is Spider-Man and he drops the Death Star and it falls into pieces. So I think I saw that might have been somebody's favorite that went through the poll. So, okay. So I thought I'd maybe take us back and, 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 you know, some of us still play with Legos. I hope we all do. I mean, I'm I'm still playing with them. I'm an adult, but I thought we might kind of look at like what are some of the skill sets that we can learn uh, by playing with Legos. And so, here's ten items that kind of struck me is that that I put down and and pose here that you know with with motor skills, like often we give Lego sort of the bigger bricks to the little kids, right? And we get them kind of moving their hands and sort of building things and putting things in place, right? So we get just sort of those basic motor skills. And then hopefully if you're lucky, like my daughter's always asking me like, oh, this brick doesn't belong here. Can you get it off? And of course there's this like, this like orange wrench thing that you can use to, you know, kind of pry bricks up and those kinds of things. So there's like even tools that you need to do that. Um, some other skill sets like cooperation and teamwork. If you're doing a build uh, with somebody else, maybe that's even like in your class or with a with a classmate or with a sibling or whatever the case may be. It could be with your parents, whatever the case case is. Um, you know, we often learn skill sets of teamwork and cooperation uh, from from our Lego building days. The other piece to it too, as well. Um, Third item is a sense of accomplishment. So I can certainly tell you when I got done with the Millennium Falcon um, at Christmas, I was very proud and uh, 
my accomplishment. And so that was like a big uh, lift to my own uh, ego and spirit, I guess. I was very excited to get that put together and to show it to my wife and to show it to our, our daughter. And uh, I probably posted a picture on uh, social media and things like that. So we get a chance to kind of, um, you know, once we once we accomplish something, there's, there's that sense of accomplishment that's important as well. Uh, we learned with Legos to be persistent. So um, I know like when my daughter's building sometimes, she doesn't always kind of count the bricks right. She doesn't get it quite in the right spot. And so I have to some sort of step in and help her like be persistent. Like, okay, let's back step, you know, a couple of steps in the book and let's look and see what happened and see where we went wrong. And so you can kind of trace your steps and sort of figure things out. Um, so persistence is a really important uh, piece of, of a skill set from Lego that is it helps us through our lives. Um, another big piece is like solving puzzles and solving problems. So we end up, um, of course, you know, you get this box of Lego and all the bricks are in there, or you might be starting your own from scratch. You know, you might be one of those experts building from scratch. Well, you're, you're essentially building this 3D puzzle, right? You're putting this together. And through the course of that, you're going to run into a lot of problems. You know, you're going to like not get things correct sometimes or not see the big picture and be able to get all of the pieces stitched together. So playing with Lego gives us um, the ability to hone in that skill of problem solving. The other piece to it, of course, is creativity. And so um, as adults, as a parent myself, I really want my children to be um, playing with Legos like I did because it stirs a sense of, of creativity. So I can remember, you know, when I was a kid, there weren't too many kits that were out, um, you know, with all the bricks and everything. So we had just the big, huge buckets and piles of bricks, right? And so we would just start stitching things together and we'd get super creative what we'd build, a, a cityscape or a, a ship or a car or whatever the case may be, we, we would end up um, really kind of honing those creative skills in as well. Um, we get some skills in science, right? We we learn that gravity works or doesn't work or can break our builds and those kinds of things. So we just get some basic scientific reality um, as well. Uh, we learn a bit about technology, right? Like, okay, what goes into building a skyscraper, right? Like you have to build the, the walls and you need all the structures and pieces that go with it. And then even today there's, um, with, with a lot of the Legos and Lego kits, there's a lot of motor kits to go with that. And so you can program um, your Legos. There's uh, remote controls that go with those, right? So you can build different kinds of robots. And, and I hope that you've done that. I hope that you have access to those technologies. Um, but that skill set's important as well. We learn about math. So just like really basic things like counting, like, okay, I need a brick. I need an eight brick. I need a two brick. I, you know, whatever the case may be. You learn just those um, sort of basic skills as well, just in using math and angles and all the different pieces that come into play as well. And then just kind of a final skill set that was, I think, pushed me into the engineering world was the idea of, of actually engineering something, of taking either a, you know, if you buy a kit, it's going to usually comes with a book. And so you're using, um, you're using the method, you're using the um, outline and the guidance that some brick master has given you um, in putting together this Death Star or, or Millennium Falcon or whatever the case may be, right? But you are you are engineering something, you are putting something together. Um, and with the Millennium Falcon, it's cool because it opens and um, the top of it opens and there's actually a couple spring-loaded lasers that shoot and things like that. So. Um, lots of fascinating um, uses there of technology. So these are just a few of the skill sets that I can think of that um, that we can get from playing with Lego. I don't know if anybody was watching um, here just this last spring. There was a, a great show on Fox. It was called Lego Masters. Um, and uh, Batman, I think Batman was the, uh, the host. And so uh, Will, whatever his name is, was the host of that. And then uh, here's a picture of the couple who actually ended up as uh, Lego masters. They won this um, contest. Um, and through the course of that contest, um, all of the skill sets that I, I've just, just mentioned, I saw all of these pieces being um, used, even by these adults 
um, who are, are in this competition to become Lego masters. So. And then, you know, I mentioned my daughter, our 10 year old, she as well has uh, kind of caught the bug. So we watched Lego masters together. Uh, my wife would kind of lay on the other end of the couch and usually take a nap during that hour that we would watch that because she wasn't particularly um, keen on watching people building Lego uh, for any entertainment value. But um, my daughter and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And so, um, so one of the things that we continually um, are open to buying for her are Lego kits. And she's, so she's very excited. So she's built a ski resort in the background of this slide. You can see there's a ski resort over to the left and she's built a house and um, little tiki huts. And she built a full, there's a ship there on the full right. That's a big yacht kind of thing. And so uh, lots of interactive pieces that she gets to use. So, so uh, here's the second poll question. Just take a pause here and pose another question to you. Um, so I gave kind of a list of about 10 skills that kind of the top of my mind, I guess, that you can get from playing with um, Legos. But there's so many other skills that I didn't list. So what what other skill sets can you think that I didn't mention? Patient, I just saw somebody throw patience up there. So that's good. That you can see that are beneficial from creating Lego from creative Lego play. So I'll give you a second here to drop your questions into the chat if you want, and just make sure you're sending those to everybody. And then if you're on Facebook as well, you can drop those into the into the comments. Yeah, I see improvis improv improvising, improvising, yes. Yeah, details. Yeah, I see some of those coming through. Focus, yeah. Yeah, resourcefulness. Yeah. Yeah, I was in, in the Lego Masters show. It was fascinating to watch because they had these huge walls of just all of the bricks that you could ever need. And so they would run over to these giant bins full of bricks and they'd just start pulling all the different colors and different sizes and everything that they needed. So it was super fascinating. Okay, we'll move on here. Great, go ahead and keep dropping in your, uh, your answers there, so. All right. So kind of switch a little bit to what I do at Micron. So on the first slide, I mentioned that I'm a, I'm a test engineer. So, so what does that mean? So what, what am I supposed to be doing uh, as, a, as an engineer at Micron? Well, my very specific role is that I, I, ver I verify and I validate that our products are functioning and working properly and will function properly for our end user and customers. So my specific role right now is uh, in the mobile and automotive DRAM uh, space. So um, dynamic random access memory is one of the products that Microns makes. We also make um, another memory I'm sure most of you are familiar with, NAND memory. So that uh, would be the, the memory within like your cell phone or something like that that holds your pictures and your operating systems and those kinds of things. Um, the DRAM is a much uh, much more, uh, it's accessible much faster. And so the processor uses the DRAM as a way to feed it information at high speeds. And so my work and my job um, as a test engineer is to um, to test that product at the speed, uh, the high speeds that an end user customer is going to use those, um, whether that be in a iPhone or a Samsung phone or the multiple handsets that are out there or in uh, iPads and Kindles and all the different um, pads that exist. And we're even starting to um, expand much of our, our memory space. Um, it's starting to grow, especially in the automotive realm. So uh, end users, automotive makers um, are seeking out our memory solutions uh, more and more these days as your car becomes much more digital. It becomes, I don't know if it's smarter, but it's definitely has a lot more sensors in it and has a lot more features and functions and those kinds of things. So, so I'm, I'm tasked with this, this uh, last line of defense. I'm, I'm as a test engineer, I'm, as possible quality product uh, for our customers and end users. So what I get to do every day is to break things before our customer does. So as we stand sort of as the last line of defense for quality with um, 
with our um, with our, our end user and our customer um, test plays a very vital role because we end up getting the product, the DRAM, in its final package form, and we get it in the final form. It's actually right before it's going to be shipped out to a customer. So to make sure it works, we also have to make sure that it's marked correctly, that it looks correct, uh, that we haven't damaged the the product in our handling of it, and all sorts of different things like that. So the other thing I do as a as a test engineer is. I'm always doing uh, failure analysis. So I'm always trying to find problems. If there are specific problems with our with our product, then what I want to do is feed that information back up the the chain to the original place that we started um, to fabricate the the memory back into what we call a fab. And so a lot of my work is is communicating and bridging gaps back into Micron internally, so that we can. Um, we can detect uh, defects in our product much earlier. And then if we find that there's uh, a specific root cause to a defect, maybe there's a particular tool in the fab that's not uh, operating properly, things like that, we'll end up feeding that information back to the fab so that they can, um, they can fix the issues. Um, and then they can get us a better yield, a better quality product. And then that keeps, that keeps our customers much happier as well. So. Um, another piece to being a test engineer at Micron is uh, we kind of uniquely as a company we we like to uh, we like to do things sort of our own way, um, so we don't follow the standards of a lot of people out in the industries, and so we end up actually making our own test equipment, um, which is cool in and of itself because we have like a totally separate group that actually does that. So their job is to um, build test equipment that uh, works and functions properly. Um, and we'll test our product to the highest standards. So a lot of the what I have to do um, as a test engineer, as well as just ensuring that our test equipment is functioning properly. So one of the things that I'll do is uh, we'll simulate the conditions that a customer or an end user will encounter. And so I have a question about that um, here around um, temperature. So pose another question to you from a sort of a manufacturing uh, micron standpoint. So like I mentioned, a lot of our customers are automotive manufacturers. So Audi and BMW, Mercedes, you can you can list them and name them. Um, virtually every car at this point has some amount of DRAM built into it with uh, computer systems that are built into it. But a lot of the uh, audio displays, your um, backup cameras, um, all of the processing power for that. A lot more of the cars now, as you know, and you, your parents have a car that um, has sensors in it for automatic braking or uh, lane assist and those kinds of things. So all of that processing from those sensors has to ultimately get it uh, be processed um, in, in DRAM as a big piece of that, that, that the DRAM is important, that it's, it's helping your, your computer, your brain, your processor, whatever you want to call it, of the car process all of this information that it's taking in. So we, you know, as you know, cars operate at all sorts of different temperatures. So I might pose to you, at what temperature extremes do you think a customer expects a DRAM and a mobile application to function? So I'll let you guys drop that in there. It is, it is incredibly hot and also incredibly cold. So it's also different and it, it's also different from like a, a mobile um, uh, temperature specification. So we, 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 for short, we call them specs. So these are data sheet specs that uh, customers expect our products to function at. And so, oh good, somebody must've hit the data sheet there. I see a minus 40 to 125 C and that's exactly right, actually. So yeah, if you could think about, you know, the one of the coldest days in Alaska, if you live up there and you drive a SUV, you know, BMW SUV and you go out and uh, hopefully the battery's functioning, but you know, it can get minus 10, minus 20 degrees up in some of these areas um, on the coldest days. So as a test engineer, I have to simulate those conditions, right? And so, we, I wish that we could drop into the cold or into the heat and test them that way. So we can't do that. That's not very cost effective. So 
what we end up doing, of course, within the test chambers that we socket devices to electrically test them, um, within those chambers, we have to maintain temperatures that are extreme as well. So exactly right. We, we actually do test um, automotive DRAM anywhere from minus 40 degrees C, which is very cold, up to 125 degrees C. And just for reference, don't forget that water boils at 100 degrees C. So, um, so 125 C seems to be sort of the max that we have. And uh, you might think of, you know, for you, for you that are in California, if you've ever been to Death Valley, it's one of the hottest places in the United States, right? You can reach 120 degrees there. Um, so we can imagine, you know, your car has to function in these extremes. So we have to be able to um, test at this area. So, okay. So just kind of wrap up a little bit here, Lego, and kind of make a connection to what I do as a test engineer at Micron. You know, what are some of the skill sets that a test engineer needs to thrive at Micron? And you'll see that's the same list <laughs> that I created for Legos, right? We need motor skills. So we need the ability, like I have to sometimes get uh, parts socketed into engineering um, test equipment. Um, I have to be able to solder boards together. I have to be able to solder um, uh, bridges and, and circuitry together. I often have to set up oscilloscopes so that I can uh, look at um, waveforms and things like that. So there's a lot of like motor skills that go in that. As components and parts become smaller and smaller, it becomes that much more difficult to be able to uh, electrically make electrical connections um, with a lot of the products that we're selling. So those are important. Cooperation and teamwork, I touched on that a little bit. Like, I'm constantly in communication with a team here locally in Boise, but a team in Japan, and Singapore, and Taiwan, because Micron's so global. Um, so I'm constantly in the in a mode of, of teamwork and cooperation um, with multiple people who are all supporting even just one product. Um, and one product that Micron could have hundreds of people that are working and supporting it. So um, a sense of accomplishment certainly comes from my work. So I enjoy very much what I do. And I get a big sense of accomplishment when, you know, we have the ability to do something like reduce the cost, um, or if we are working on a product and we failure um, mode, and we can feed that information back to another apartment who can fix something, so we can help others um, even solve their own problems. That's a huge sense of accomplishment, accomplishment as well. Uh, persistence, for sure, uh, in the in the engineering field, but at Micron, for sure. Um, from my own experience, I know that there have been times when um, I've had to be super tenacious at, at getting something done and persistent in trying to solve a problem, figure something out. And it can take hours, it can take days, it can take months sometimes to figure out and solve some of, some of the, even the bigger problems as well. Um, so problem solving and, and puzzles, that's a huge piece of what I do um, as a test engineer. So there's no... There's no booklet, there's no manual, there's not a textbook that tells me how to solve problems uh, for Micron. They did, I didn't have a class, you know, solving problems at Micron 101. Um, a lot of those pieces are just skill sets that we end up uh, picking up over time. But the skill sets that you had uh, from solving problems and being persistent with your Lego builds, um, they carry over. All of that carries over into the into the reality of work. So. Um, in the engineering fields, creativity is a huge thing. So for me to come up with creative methods to new creative methods to test things, to break things, um, to test things more efficiently, to reduce costs, those kinds of things. There's a lot of creativity that often goes into what we're doing um, in those areas as well. And then, of course, the last four pieces are, you know, the STEM um, items, the sciences, um, you know, those pieces are used every day, especially like right now, I'm doing a lot of work on uh, thermal work. So thermodynamics and, and the test chamber, like I said, where we keep the product either cold or hot, there's there's issues there. So I'm working through those. Technology, you know, the um, coding that I use, we use Fortran, uh, or I started with Fortran and now uh, Python is a, is a coding language that I use a lot. So that technology is um, always present. Uh, mathematics, I use mathematics every day. So, you know, we live in a, it's a digital world and it's um, a digital company at Micron. So I'm always doing a lot of math and hex and 
going back and forth between all of those. So definitely you want to hone those skill sets um, as well. Um, and then I just use my everyday engineering virtually every day, just problem solving um, and, and trying to put together um, code, most of it through through Python code of um, trying to create um, a, a better and more efficient product uh, for our customer, the end customer. So, okay. How did we go there? Is that... Awesome. Thank you, Mac. You're uh, welcome. Does anyone have questions? We did get a couple of questions typed in. Okay. Somebody asked, what is FAB? FAB is a, is a nickname. It's short for fabrication. And so within the FAB, uh, for semiconductor companies, you might think of it even as Legos, like just visualize in your mind, um, you know, when you make like a cityscape, like a skyscrapers of Legos, right? You have kind of interconnects and you have the roads and all that kind of stuff. Well, we're fabricating, we're literally printing um, metal circuitry on silicon. And we have these interconnects and of, um, of roads of, ele of electrical connections that make up these um, unbelievably tiny <laughs> little little cities, little um, little buildings and structures that we put together um, at unbelievably small um, dimensions. And the fab is responsible for that. So inside of a fab, you're going to find tools that um, that help us print and create that technology or that uh, circuitry within the on the silicon wafers. Very cool. Another question, do you test overclocks? Um, we do on some of our products, yeah. So I'm guessing there's probably a gamer out there asking that question, but um, yes, we do in many of our products, especially now uh, overclocking like with graphics. I don't work in that area, so I'm not an expert at um, exactly how they do it, but um, there are uh, methods that we use, yeah, it's an overclock product as well. And Ryan asks, would you participate in LEGO Masters? Um, I don't know that after watching the show, it seemed like a lot of pressure. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, I'm sure I think at work, I was like, I don't, I'm not sure that I would want to do it. And I don't like some of the things they built were unbelievable. I mean, big, elaborate, um, amazing builds that they did, which I, I'm not sure I have the skill set to do that, but if I if I could practice and get the skills, I would love to do it. It was a really great show. Awesome. Any other questions, you guys? I don't see any more. Thank you so much, Mac. This was awesome. And thank you, Mike John, as well. And we'll see you guys next week for Techie Tuesday. Awesome. Thank you, Cynthia. Bye. Thanks, Matt. Hey, Cynthia, actually stop streaming before you leave and then you try that. Hit the little dots. I'm just thinking.